So Frank, you've been busy lately. It's been a fun time to be a technology M&A banker. Before um, we talk about all the great stuff that's happening right now, I was wondering if you could go back and just, because you know, there might be some 20-something year olds in the audience, and tell them about your original trip you know, to Silicon Valley. I found a picture, I think it's from, <laughs> I think it's from two or three years ago. But, yeah. Uh, um, so I first came to Silicon Valley in 1979 when I was a first year uh, student at Stanford to get my MBA. And um, I was a teaching assistant to an investments prof named Jack McDonald. And the first assignment I had was to go down to a little privately held computer company called Apple to pick up an Apple IIe and to bring it back to Stanford and to port an investment analysis program from an HP mini computer to the Apple IIe. And I thought, well, this is interesting because here's a little mini computer. It doesn't have any applications. There were no word processors, spreadsheets, databases, or anything. All it had was the basic programming language. Right. And I sort of didn't understand why this was going to be such a big thing. And then about a year later, the same professor uh, brought uh, another 20-something into the class. I was 25 at the time, and he brought another 25-year-old into the classroom named Steve Jobs. And um, I thought at the time I was kind of a hotshot MBA, uh, worked at Morgan Stanley for two years. You know, I was, I was pretty cool. But in walked this guy that was my same age, uh, college dropout. And he had founded a company that was, uh, had just finished a fiscal year of over 100 million in revenues, was very profitable, was about three weeks away from going public. Uh, that would have put a valuation on the company back then of $1.2 billion. And Steve himself was going to be worth over $200 million in $1980. And I said to myself, how did you do that? <laughs> because now it seems almost trite. It's happened a thousand right. times uh, since then. Maybe not to that same extent. But I thought it was very interesting how uh, someone that young had created something that valuable and why investors were willing to take a risk and give them money. And was that single event the thing that convinced you to come out here and plant a flag? Yeah, because at the time, Morgan Stanley was the lead manager on the IPO, and that's my prior employer. And I thought, wow, if I could come back to Morgan Stanley, work in San Francisco, and work with cool companies like Apple, yeah. that would be really great. Although the people back in New York were telling me it would be career suicide, I'd be out of sight, out of mind, wouldn't get promoted on time. And, you know, I didn't really care because I you know, I'd found my passion. So what... What, if you could, just maybe one or two things, what's the same, you know, way but now here in 2010 versus back then, and what are some of the key differences? I think what's the same and the thing that keeps all of us so interested in the area is the creativity, the risk-taking, and the passion that people have as entrepreneurs to change the world, change how we communicate, change how we do commerce, change how we live our daily lives. And, uh, and also the infrastructure to support entrepreneurs in taking risk, whether it's venture capital firms, law firms, investment banks, suppliers, all of whom uh, take the risk because the upside is so great and, and they've been rewarded so much. And what about differences? So what's different is, you know, well, in 1990, the year that we took Cisco public, there were um, only 285 public technology companies, and if you added up all of their market caps, it would have been the grand sum of $237 billion, which is less than Apple's market cap today. And today, there are over 6,000 public technology companies worth trillions of dollars. Yeah. And um, it's, it's gone from a niche market that few people understood and that was a small part of our economy to a very mainstream market, many segments of which are mature, but still has lots of exciting growth segments to it. So it's much more a fundamental part of the global economy yeah. uh, than it was that back then. Okay. I want to talk a bit about the founding of Catalyst, but before that, I was wondering if you could give us your thoughts on the IPO market. So there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about what's working, what's not. You're now in a position where you advise, but you're not underwriting companies, Correct. so presumably you have an open opinion on this. So share with us what you're thinking right now about the IPO market. Well, you know, the IPO market has played an amazing role in the country's uh, growth um, in, in technology development and in incentivizing entrepreneurs to take risk and leave big companies to follow their dreams. And it used to account for about half of venture capital liquidity events, but in the last 10 years, it's been more like 10% or less. 
And so the IPO market isn't the same predictable resource that it once was. And there are a variety of reasons. Um, there, there were uh, periods where there are lots of IPOs that didn't work out. There are fewer bankers willing to work with small companies. Big mutual funds have gotten to the point where they have trillions of dollars under management and a $2 million allocation uh, in an IPO isn't going to move the needle for them. And there's friction to taking companies public right now. There's regulatory friction. Um, you know, the bar has been set higher. Companies need to be much bigger, have accomplished a lot more in order to take advantage of it. And as I said, there are now 6,000 public companies that you have to compete against for the right. attention of a scarce number of analysts and investors. Well, we'll talk about how to surf that in a minute. So two years ago about, you decided to start a new investment bank. And you did it very differently than how you've done it in the past. You've always run a large bulge bracket firm tech practice. Right. And now you launch Catalyst. Right. So tell us what, you're, what motivated you to come back and why did you do it different? What motivated me to come back was I, uh, after a deep uh, soul searching uh, uh, exercise, um, I decided what I really loved most about uh, my profession was advising great technology companies on transforming the world and, um, and, and helping them see around corners and skate to where the puck's going to be connecting people across sectors in a creative way that um, might form some partnerships that uh, will, will shake the world up. And um, what I didn't miss about investment banking was running large organizations with 500 people and being a liaison. I wanted to get, have something that was smaller, more focused, where I could get back to the first love, which was delivering the advice. Yeah. And um, uh, we formed Catalyst in March of 2008. It was, uh, we launched the business two days after Bear Stearns was sold for $2 a share and six months before Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. It was an interesting time to form a new investment bank when uh, the existing crowd uh, weren't exactly covering themselves in glory. Yeah. Many of them were uh, coming close to bankruptcy. And a lot of it was because they got into much more capital intensive businesses, lending, proprietary right. trading, doing their own thing with capital that, um, that caused their capital structure to get out of whack. And they were also in lots of different businesses that sometimes uh, had inherent conflicts where you have to both please the corporate customer yeah. and please the investor customer and maybe even trade your own yeah. book on top of that. So uh, we decided to go backwards in time to the Morgan Stanley that I joined in 1977. I wanted to have a firm that was totally focused on advice, totally focused on the tech sector, yeah. and that would give companies advice based on what was the, in their best interest without being in all these so other this is this is a slide from your your own company on how you position yourself. It's, it, you're, you're up and to the right, but the axis go the other way. It's I think less, that's just an accident. Le, le, <laughs> not broad-based and happen? focused on tech. So yeah. how, how will people pitch against that? What will a big bank say? A big bank will say, well, you know, if you have to make a big acquisition, we can lend you the money and also give you the advice. We can do more things for yeah. you. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I guess... In some respects, sometimes that gets in the way. And you know, yeah. one of our first assignments was working with Brocade, where they had uh, an M&A advisor who was also the financing agent and who also decided to give a bridge loan off of their own balance sheet. So they and when push came conflicts. to shove, they had yeah. some conflicts there, yeah. and we were brought in to be the pure M&A advisor. So people in the room may not know. I'm sure some of you do. Hopefully, we can bring a slide up here. Um, in a very short amount of time, you guys have established yourself as a major player on the high-tech M&A front. So these five transactions all average around two, $2.5 billion. And then I guess you have another one that just got announced yesterday or the day before. Um, this will sound self-serving, but I, I think people are really curious, how in the world do you jump in and get that kind of traction so quickly? Well, we were very, very fortunate in um, that about three or four weeks after we launched Catalyst, our friends at Google asked us to advise them right in the middle of the Microsoft Yahoo hostile takeover, which right. was a $45 billion deal, the biggest hostile takeover in the history of the industry. Yeah. And it really helped establish us as a credible player in the industry to be advising Google on such an important assignment. But I think um, the, the value that people see in us is in our people. We, we, can't, we don't have a balance sheet. We don't have a big distribution network of uh, sales and trading people, but we do have among the most experienced advisors in what we do, which is give advice to technology companies. We've got over 100 man years. We've got people who've run the technology practice at Morgan Stanley, at Deutsche Bank, at Credit Suisse, the head of M&A, the head of software at Goldman Sachs, the head of internet at Credit Suisse, the head of semiconductor M&A at uh, Credit Suisse, um, the head of European technology at uh, 
uh, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, and Merrill Lynch. And so we're experienced. We've done uh, maybe 750 transactions over the last 30 years, worth more than a half a trillion dollars. We know the industry, so we're not just kind of parachuting in yeah. uh, because we're, uh, you know, trying to do a trade. We view ourselves as participants in the technology industry more so than in financial services. We have a network of contacts where there are very few boards where we can't reach out to the CEO yeah. or key board members. What, what, one, of, one phrase that's been used derogatorily but I think is a huge, huge um, kind of overture to what you've done over the years is this Friends of Frank concept. So you've got a number of people who have worked with you over the years who are extremely loyal to you. I've seen it and, and consider myself part of that group. What, what, what do you, why do you earn that kind of trust and loyalty with people over the long run? I think over the long run, we give the company the advice based on what's in their best interest, not what's in ours. And we often tell companies not to do deals. And if our business model is that we only make money when we do a deal and we tell them not to do it, yeah. um, that, that means that we're, uh, we're, we're serving their interests well. And <clears throat> whether at the bigger firms or here at Catalyst, we've tried to convey a passion for the business and uh, deliver an outstanding level of service um, and just try to convince our clients that we'll go through brick walls right. to get their business done. Okay. So let's get some of that experience <laughs> and hand it out to the group in a free, okay. free tutorial here real quick on both the IPO and M&A front. Sure. So assume, you know, a young CEO from the audience has come to you. We can make up the metrics or talk about what they should be and say, Frank, we're thinking about an IPO. What, what kind of questions are you going to ask them? What kind of advice would you give them? Circa 2010, yeah. with all the stuff that you talked about. Well, I, I'd ask them, first of all, why is it important for you to be a public company? What, what are you trying to accomplish by being a public company? And do you have the, uh, not just snapshot, but the full motion video over five or ten years to deliver on a company that can really build value, uh, not be a one-trick pony? Uh, because it's, it's a lot easier to go public than to be public. Um, now, there are a lot of advantages to being public, right? You've got access to uh, capital on reasonable terms. You sometimes have a branding event when a company uh, gets a lot more publicity during its IPO. Um, it certainly is a liquidity option for the shareholders and for the employees, and it gives you an acquisition currency. So right. there's a lot of good things, but it, there's also some risks because um, you, you hitch yourself to the quarterly wagon of delivering predictably numbers that meet or beat Wall Street's expectations. And you remember what happened when companies would only meet their expectations, their yeah. stock would go down. And so sometimes it's great to have a report card that says what you're worth every day, and sometimes it's not so great right. if you're living in a fishbowl. What, ab what about more tactically? Yeah. You know, th we've had these things that have gone from single book runner, dual book runner, all oh, these two hand, one hand, three hand. What, 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 once again, circa 2010, what would you tell somebody just as generic advice for how to structure an IPO? Well, you know, I've been saying for uh, a while that we need to reinvent the IPO market for the current conditions. And I think, Bill, your uh, IPO for OpenTable uh, is a really good example of how people didn't follow the, what has become the traditional model of multiple book runners and spreading the pie too thin. Um, I think you need to concentrate the economics. I think there's rare occasions where you need more than a single book runner and more than a half a dozen firms that are you know, participating in the deal at all. Right. And concentrating not just the economics to the underwriters to give them something that motivates them to do well, but concentrating the allocations to investors who really understand the company and are going to be long-term holders. Because I, I, if there's one thing I'd be critical of Wall Street, it's sometimes they allocate shares based on people who are their good investor clients. Right. Not necessarily you based might on trade, trade more. Accurate. Yeah, exactly. You right. trade a lot and generate a lot of uh, of profit for them, uh, but the company should gain control over the allocations. These are your shareholders, and you shouldn't allow a Wall Street firm to say, "Hey, this is our black box. Yeah. We'll tell you who the investors are." Yeah. How should they think about research in 2010? It's changed pretty dramatically. <clears throat> it has, and I'd say. Uh, with few exceptions, uh, I'd say Mary Meeker being the, the most visible one, uh, there's been an excess of talent from the sell side uh, of Wall Street uh, because of regulatory considerations that make it impossible for analysts to really participate on investment banking uh, uh, profits. And um, a lot of the research has been insourced by the large buyers. So I think for companies today, they have to rely a lot more on making direct contact with some of the key investors, the T. Rowe Prices and Fidelities and Alliances and Jenisons and all right. those great companies, rather than relying on Wall Street as a conduit to them. Okay. Let's, uh, let's switch to M&A. So 
someone's coming in, maybe they've had, a, a, it'd be a great first question, do you need to have had a bite before you talk to a banker, engage a banker? You don't need to have had a bite, but um, you're in a much better position when you can approach buyers and say, hey, this is a company that is on the path of being independent, but it's got a bid from somebody else. It's not necessarily going to sell, but it, you know, they're thinking about it and they're asking us to reach out to you. So that's a position of strength. Uh, but I think companies need to keep in mind where they are in the musical chairs game of an industry. Uh, because the best, most spectacular sales happen when there are six buyers and one or two sellers. Right, right, right. And uh, knowing where you are, and you might not necessarily want to be the first, but you sure don't want to end up without a chair. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's really what's, what's important. What, why hire a banker at all on M&A? What is it you're going to provide that the company's not going to have just using their lawyers? Well, the lawyers are really good at the purchase agreement, but right. when it comes to understanding the strategies of the big buyers to know who to reach out to and who not to reach out to, uh, what the decision-making process and time schedule for those companies are of making decisions, and how to orchestrate a process designed to get competitive juices flowing is really a skill that very few people have. And then being able to negotiate those last few dollars <clears throat> when um, you know, it's not at all clear that the buyer wants to give it to you. That's the special you know, to sauce. To that point, I once had a large, I'll leave the company unnamed, but a head of corp dev after he lost on a <clears throat> transaction tell me, uh, if you want to make sure we don't buy anything, hire Frank and George again. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was an ironic advertisement for your services. <laughs> They don't like to see us on the other side because they know that, um, you know, we, we know who to call and we know how to run a process that's designed to get a great price for sellers and that's what we've been proving. And it, it, there's kind of a, a flywheel effect when, <clears throat> when you have two public bidding wars for a company like Data Domain one year and three par this year, then everybody wants to know, well, is there something special about that group? Is, are, is there things companies <clears throat> should be doing along the way yes. to, to heighten the chance that they'll have an M&A? Yes, and I'd like to contrast this with the IPO market. In the IPO market, you can put a time schedule out there that says, okay, by week four, we're going to be on file, and then we're going to go on a road show, and then the investors are all going to see us, <clears throat> and then we're going to have a book, and then we're going to price the deal. And investors are more or less homogenous and are willing to be herded like that. In an M&A environment, the buyers are <clears throat> very, very different. Some move at a glacial pace. Some can move over a weekend. Uh, some like exclusive for 60 days and others are comfortable not doing that. Yeah. And some like to know you for six months before or a year before or have you in their catalog or have a partnership with you before they're willing to, to buy you. And others don't. And so orchestrating that and, and getting to know these companies and having, being on, getting on their radar screen in a way that doesn't say, hey, I'm for sale and I want you to buy me, but Approaching them, uh, saying, hey, we want you to know who we are. Uh, there might be some partnership opportunities. Here's our roadmap. Without sharing your crown jewels, yeah. but letting them know who you are. And so, for example, on, um, on uh, Three Par, uh, they were in OEM discussions with the three buyers that ultimately considered whether or not to buy them. And each of them said, hey, if you ever get a call that someone wants to buy you, we want to yeah. know about it. Yeah. And so d generating that knowledge and education early okay. before there's a transaction there and knowing what the processes are is helpful. Okay. One last question and then I want to turn it open for questions from the audience. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, you have a vision or a view about what's been changing recently yes. in, in, the, uh, in the landscape. Could you talk about how you see it changing and what it means from an acquisition standpoint? Absolutely. Um, uh, having started in the industry when uh, the, 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 the model was mainframe and mini computer companies who did everything from designing their own hardware, their own operating system, uh, their own communications protocols, their own database, <clears throat> and, and then having deconstructed that model for the last 25 to 30 years when IBM outsourced the chip and the operating system on the PC, and we lived in a world of uh, specialists. Intel did the chip and uh, Microsoft the operating system, Oracle the database, SAP the app, Cisco the networking, EMC the storage. A lot of the M&A um, activity took place within those sectors and there was typically only one or two buyers who were uh, interested in, in, in you know, going, going across that vertical line and, and companies were comfortable partnering with uh, uh, one another up and down a stack. Uh, now we're seeing a return to the vertical model <clears throat> and there's a new leadership uh, group that's, that's coming on. I mean, in the past 25 or 30 years, the leadership group has been 
you know, the Microsofts of the world, the Intels of the world, the Cisco's of the world, <clears throat> and the Dell's of the world. And this chart actually shows at various points oh, in sorry. time, I'm sorry, going back, yeah. um, what their market caps were. So the very top row shows the market cap of these industry participants on the day that Apple bought Next, which was one of the assignments I'm, in retrospect, the proudest, proudest of. Uh, these circumstances were ironic because Apple had forgotten how to make operating systems. It's kind of like Coke forgetting how to make the syrup. Right. And they had to go outside the company to buy an operating system, and that's how they got Next. On that day, Apple's market cap was $3 billion. It was the end of 1996, and today it's pretty close to $300 billion. And um, the, new, the new leaders, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons of the world, and then Oracle's trying to uh, control the agenda in the enterprise world by rebuilding a vertical yeah. stack. Uh, that's where the market cap is flowing. Here's, so now you've got... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just go back. Yeah. So now, instead of having one or two buyers within each sector, now, you know, if you're a networking company, you might be bought not just by Cisco, but by Oracle, by IBM, by Dell, by HP, and now there are five or six big companies that yeah. want to buy almost no matter what you are. Yeah. And also, these companies also are, are trying to get into all these new markets like cloud computing, the internet, software as a service, virtualization. And it didn't matter whether they started life as a storage company, a computer company, a networking company, or an internet company. They're all skating to the same and high mobile, growth markets. Mobile. So you have these strategic, right. strategic aspirations that are cross sector, cross horizontal, vertical, Absolutely. which causes a lot of activity. And I assume this helps as well. This is the cash position of the new power players that you talked yes. about. Yes, so uh, what's not on this chart is that if you look at the top 10 technology companies out of the 75 or so that are part of the S&P 500, uh, on average those top 10 companies have 70% of the market cap and 70% of the cash. On average they have 20 billion of cash versus the rest of them who have about a billion and a half. And these are the companies, and by the way this cash is earning zero on their balance sheet, so if they no can interest. substitute growth earnings by buying companies for nothing. So a lot of strategic interest, a lot of changing, shifting plates, and a lot of cash. That should be a recipe for more M&A activity. Absolutely. Okay. Any questions from the audience? We've got about three minutes. Is he? Oh, here we go, Corey. Follow up on that. First of all, I like that you say you've got to gain credibility because anyone doesn't have to gain credibility in banking here. So that would be you. Talk a little louder. Sorry, not having to gain credibility. I think, Frank, you're fine as it comes to credi credibility. But do the, do the buyers, the notions out there, they've got a lot of cash, they're not getting any return, they could take a flyer on buying companies and see if they'll get a better cash return. But is that what the buyers are saying? I, I he, he's, he's wondering, are the, so all these dynamics exist, yeah. the, the cash being out there that yeah. would, right. but are the buyers, are the buyers um, buying into the mindset that it might be better used, you know, through acquisition than through investment? Some of them treasury? are and some of them aren't. I mean, if you look at uh, the companies who are making aggressive moves and acquisitions, you know, HP comes to mind, Dell comes to mind, IBM. Uh, has not only bought, you know, 60, 70 software companies, but their CEO publicly announced that they, they, they need to buy $20 billion more uh, of companies over the next five years. We love when they take long positions like that. Right. Um, but others have not done much acquisition at all. I think Microsoft has been a lot more conservative. Uh, Google went through a period where they weren't buying things. Now they're buying a lot of things again. Well, we're seeing Apple start buying. Apple starting to buy. used to. Amazon's done a few acquisitions here Correct. recently who didn't use to. So... We are seeing that pick up. Absolutely. Okay. No more questions from the audience. Okay. Oh, here we go. Adam Lashinsky. The press is after you. Uh, Frank, would you talk a little bit more about the soul searching that you did before deciding to do Catalyst? Sure. Um, that it, 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 was a, it was a path uh, that I went on and some people started speculating that I'd go out and do a big private equity fund. And um, I started to think, oh man, people want me to do that. I better do that, otherwise I might be a failure. And so I started to explore that. And um, uh, I guess fortunately or unfortunately, it was during a time when all the signals were that that market was uh, peaking, that uh, the deals that were being done were at very high prices with lots of leverage, uh, that you needed a partner who had an investment track record 
When Blackstone decided that uh, it was going to go public, it froze talent in the industry because everyone felt you know, it was their chance to go public and, and lock in big returns and stay with that company. <clears throat> and I asked one of my colleagues uh, who had gone on to a, a private equity firm, hey, you know, what are you doing today? And he says, well, you see this here um, spreadsheet? It's the cost of goods uh, sold spreadsheet for XYZ company, and I'm trying to save them 50 basis points. And I said, well, I don't know who's less qualified to do that than I. <laughs> um, and when I asked him that same question uh, about a month later, um, uh, he had the same answer. So, uh, so that was, that was uh, a point. I, I've also uh, thought about um, doing something more directly re related to philanthropy. I've got a good friend, uh, Russ Hall, who has a really neat business called Legacy which is a fund of funds, but where all of the investors promise that all the returns will go to the charities of their choice, and it's a network of philanthropists that share a lot of um, uh, their, their, their common passions. And I thought that that would really be a neat thing to, to, to think about as well, but maybe a little bit later in life. Um, I also thought about, well, is it time to shift over to, to green tech or clean tech? And maybe if I was 40, I, I might have taken a shot at it, but I felt that my network and my passion was more focused on the tech industry and that my first love, again, was advising companies. And um, so at the end of the day, I decided that I, I wanted to do the advisory work, but do it in a way from a platform that tried to eliminate all the friction from the prior, prior platforms. Cool. Thanks. All right. We're out of time. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Well, great.